to even get into the leadership arena, yeah, you got to have character. If you don't have character, mm-hmm. you might grow something, blow something up, do something extravagant, but you'll not make a difference for the kingdom long haul without Christ-like yeah. character. In terms of leading, I think there's always something to learn as to how to lead people effectively. Hey there, I'm Matthew Foley and this is ISO Insights, where God's truth grows in the midst of current culture, renewing the mind and spirit. Welcome back to ISO Insights. We have Pastor Chris Goins back again, uh, and we, it was a great last episode we had with him where he dove into some very real things in the church, things that people need to hear to minister to them and their families today. And to dive, today we're going to dive into something that relates to his uh, 40 years in ministry, 35 years in pastoral work, and I don't know, how long have you been uh, with uh, John Maxwell's crew in training leadership? Uh, 2017, I started okay. working with John Maxwell team. Gotcha. So all that's involved with leadership, uh, I'm sure those that have been in leadership before or even in management, which could be distinguished from that, uh, it, definitely according to John Maxwell's own principles for leadership, he does make a distinguishment between those two. Yeah. But uh, someone who's been a part of leadership will know all of the systems that go into it and the ins and outs, and Pastor Chris is very aware of those systems. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to jump in first. Um, when did you start to become aware as a pastor of the need for uh, certain disciplines in leadership, certain mm-hmm. things? Okay, well, yeah, now I'm in this position of leadership, but whoa, there's a, there are some pointers that I can be given that actually help me navigate what all this looks like. Yeah. When I first became a pastor, that was in 1988, mm-hmm. going back a while, I realized very, very quickly that I needed to know more. I was in my early 20s, Mm -hmm. and oh my goodness, the gap of knowledge between what I could see Mm -hmm. and what I could actually implement became very apparent. Mm -hmm. So I began to read as much as possible. I also began to pray that God would provide a mentor who could lead me in that leadership journey. Interestingly enough, one one day I looked at my wife and said, you know, I think I would go anywhere and even work as a children's pastor. If I could get under a leader Mm -hmm. who could help me discover what it really means to lead the people of God, because I believe I lack so much when it comes to effectively leading these people. A day or two later, the phone rang. I had mentioned that day, by the way, that I would even be a children's pastor. (laughs) A day or two later, the phone rang, and a guy invited me to come on their staff as children's pastor. Mm -hmm. I took that position, one of the best decisions I ever made, because what I learned under that individual Mm -hmm. in that environment was life-changing to me. One of the first books that individual gave me was a book by John Maxwell. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think, Developing the Leader Within You. Mm. Now they have a 2.0. I got the 1.0 version because I got the one that came out like 92 or 93. Mm. And he said, Chris, read this and we'll meet weekly and talk about it. I read that book and it revolutionized my life. Mm. I look back today and so many of the things that were written in that little book Uh, Developing the Leader Within You. Now they've got Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. So many of those things still influence me today. In fact, not long after that, that same individual said, hey, we want to pay you to go to a John Maxwell conference in Atlanta. And uh, I actually got to go to a conference where John Maxwell introduced his legendary book, The 21 Mm -hmm. Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. I was there the first time he had premiered that material. We all got a free copy of that book on the way out. That book, I've probably read that book five or six times, mm-hmm. you know, here at ISO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're going through the book right now. So it was, it was late 80s to early 90s that I began to really realize I needed to grow and learn more about leadership. And John Maxwell, his material became a central mm-hmm. part of that journey. So what kind of distinguishes these kind of leadership seminars from, let's say, like personal development seminars where people are taught about how to kind of order their own life if they feel like that they need more 
order, they want to see more success in their business. Uh, what are the distinguish marks, the distinguishing marks like, okay, but in these leadership classes, this is what people are going to learn and these are the results that they'll get in their life and from yeah. their leadership? I think that's a great question. Here's what I would say. Before I ever learned about John Maxwell, mm. a big book was making the rounds in the 80s when I was uh, an itinerant speaker doing a lot of evangelism. A guy by the name of Gordon McDonald mm. wrote a book called Ordering Your Private World. And that book was all about creating a world of character. Mm -hmm. Now, I can say this, I can say this on the podcast without this seeming as if it's gossip. Yeah. Gordon McDonald went on to have a very public fall. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, was, it was heart wrenching for anyone who had read that book and been so touched by the content of that mm -hmm. book. But McDonald wisely went into a program, humbled himself, went through a period of restoration, mm -hmm. came out of that restoration, and wrote another follow up book. He's written several books, Reordering your private world. In other mm -hmm. words, here's, mm -hmm. I wrote ordering your private world. Wow. Tried to live that out, missed some stuff, caused me to wind up in a ditch. I've come out of that ditch. Mm -hmm. Here's what I've discovered the other side of that. So I would say the content I learned from McDonald about systems and structures, this was my feeling. I was brought up in a very classical Pentecostal church, rich on passionate mm -hmm. worship. Mm -hmm rich in those regards, but somewhat lacking in terms of giving us systems and structures mm -hmm. for developing a very whole and what I might define as, and I don't think it's, it's always helpful to define it like this, a really stable life. I think something in me craved stability, mm -hmm. order, all of this kinds of symmetry. So I leaned into some of those things mm -hmm. like McDonald's book. So that's one side. I think you've got to have that. By the way, to even get into the leadership arena, yeah. you've got to have character. If you don't have character, mm -hmm. you might grow something, blow something up, do something extravagant, but you'll not make a difference for the kingdom mm -hmm. long haul without Christ-like yeah. character. So that's got to be essential. Leadership to me, John Maxwell, this is legendary with him and defines leadership like this. Leadership is influence, nothing more, mm -hmm. nothing less. That's it. Wow. And what Maxwell does through so many of his books, and I haven't read all of them. That guy's so prolific. I can't mm -hmm. possibly read all of them, but I've read a lot of them. And uh, another significant book of his, and oh my goodness, I'm trying to see the book. And right now, I'm failing to remember the book in my mind, mm -hmm. but you know, for years I had been so fundamentally touched by Maxwell, got away from Maxwell's teaching, and then someone told me I needed to read this book, and I see the cover. I've read it three times and can't even remember the title, but that book reignited me and inspired me to go join the Maxwell team. What Maxwell does is give you principles for leading groups of people effectively. Mm. So to me, that's essential. Character gets you in the game. That's ordering your world, what you talked about. But in terms of leading, I think there's always something to learn as to how to lead people effectively. Mm. So if you're a person who has a very uh, a strong sense of integrity and character, and then you step into leadership, like you start to increase in the responsibilities that are on you, and with that increase, there come weights. And those weights are making you uh, feel the strain on your character that you didn't feel before, uh, the pressure. So do these principles of leadership help people learn how to manage the pressure? Or do they, what is it like? Do you want to pass off some of the pressure? I mean, I know that Jethro, for instance, in Exodus, God sends him into Moses because Moses has all these people coming with their complaints all the time. Right. And he's like, I can't take all this. Right. And then God says, through Jethro, he says, you're going to get yourself 70 elders and you're going to delineate that responsibility. Yes. I get that. But as you're increasing and getting into some of the basic elementary parts of leadership, somebody who's never faced it before, what do they need to know going in, even if they have very strong character integrity? Yeah. 
Well, keep growing your character. Mm -hmm. That's going to be essential. Mm -hmm. Always tend to your character. I'm assuming in this context, we're talking about spiritual leadership. Okay. Yeah. So I would say grow your spirit man mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is make, make God's word, time in God's word, a daily habit. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately for me, Matthew, I made God's word a daily habit, but I didn't pursue relationship with God as mm -hmm. passionately as I should. So I oh. would say make God's word a habit, but make prayer. Mm -hmm. And here's the key, presence, God's presence. Man, make that the priority of your life. Mm -hmm. Spending time in his presence. I know that it's a quaint little saying, and I know that sometimes things that are quaint or memorable mm -hmm. can become trite to people. Mm -hmm. It's not trite with me. One moment in his presence mm -hmm. changes everything. So I would say tend to, tend to those spiritual aspects mm -hmm. of leadership. Time in God's word, time with God, time mm -hmm. in his presence, time in prayer. Cultivate a rich mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Thank God that Moses had Jethro. Yeah. It seems that Moses didn't have many people he could actually trust yeah. to provide him with insight. I mean, Jethro came to him. Jethro offered insight, mm -hmm. which Moses quickly put into action, which is an indication that there was some kind of relational leverage mm -hmm. that Jethro had with Moses. That Moses, oh yeah, he's speaking. I better put it into practice. Yeah. We know of another occasion when Moses' own brother... And own sister were speaking, and Moses wasn't having it. I yeah. mean, God got involved in those arrangements and said, hey, I'm going to let you know who's really leading this company, mm -hmm. and it's not either of you two guys. It's really interesting to me that Jethro was a person who could call Moses out and wow. say, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And he had Moses' ear. Yeah. What was it? And it had to be more than the father-in-law thing. We, we've mm -hmm. all had in-laws who didn't have that influence. Mm -hmm. There was something about the quality of this man mm -hmm. that when he spoke, Moses thought, I've got to listen, cultivate those kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. You need someone who loves you but is not impressed by you. That's amazing. That's critical. And that's what that makes me think of because Jethro was there when Moses didn't have the rod and yeah. the power. He was there when he was just like this... <laughs> Uh, former uh, Egyptian yeah. prince who's now in the desert. He's a nobody. But yeah. Jethro loved him when he was a nobody, when he was just a sh dejected shepherd. Yeah. And so it's like Jethro wasn't impressed by him. I love that. That's yeah. powerful. Well and, well, and think of this too. Jethro believed in him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when yeah, Moses comes true. to him and says, I've got to go back to Egypt. I've got an assignment from mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at other occasions that existed in, in the mm -hmm. patriarchy. I'm talking about... When Jacob mm -hmm. wants to leave the home of Laban yeah. with his wife and family, Laban really puts pressure on him to stay, yeah. reluctantly allows him to leave. It seems that Jethro sees greatness in Moses, so Jethro fans that greatness. Mm -hmm. But then when Moses takes on an unnecessary weight, Jethro's also quick to say, hey, I believe in you. Uh -huh. you're, you're really a super guy, but you're not Superman. You've <laughs> wow. got to have some people around you. Wow. So I, I cultivate a rich relational world mm -hmm. very, very vulnerably here. Mm -hmm. I failed in that degree. I failed to create a rich relational world mm -hmm. where, where people spoke into me very candidly mm -hmm. who were not going to leave, who were going to stay. See, Jethro wasn't going anywhere. Mm. And by going anywhere, I mean, he wasn't disowning Moses when yeah. he went back home. Yeah. Moses was still family. Jethro was committed to Moses so he could speak truth and Moses could know, oh, regardless of what I do, the dude's not going to leave. Wow. He's going to stay. And we've got to have people. I failed to cultivate those kinds of relationships mm -hmm. of people who could, who could call me out, call out unhealthy emotional mm. uh, issues in me, call out unhealthy leadership practices in me, but me know they're not going anywhere. They're here wow. to stay. So wow. I would say you've got to cultivate that as well. Do you think that's something when 
people get put into a position of leadership that it can become so easy to, I don't know, part of me almost wants to say outlive those kind of relationships. Does that make sense? I mean, Moses, before he entered the promised land, as time went on, I mean, all that generation is dying off. And who does he have to look to once he's, he's going through, he's lived in this place of leadership and authority for so long? Yeah. Who does he have to go to? Do you think that there's a lot of people that are in positions of leadership who th- those kind of influences, because I think most people have those at some point in their life, yeah. uh, they kind of die off or that person passes away literally sometimes and people don't realize they have to be intentional about finding a new pl- a person that can be that connection, yeah. that unconditional love. Absolutely. I think leadership is so fast and so furious mm. that that happens. It happens even without the length in years. Wow. It simply happens where mm-hmm. you've moved on. You're yeah. in a different place because leadership is happening fast. Mm-hmm. It's furious. It's quick. That's why it necessitates and intentionality, mm-hmm. living intentional, by the way, is the wow. name of that John Maxwell book I was forgetting. Yeah, it takes, <laughs> That's awesome. It takes a resolute intentionality uh-huh. to keep those relationships ongoing. This is interesting, too. We got off on Moses. This mm-hmm. wasn't planned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. Later on in Moses' life, mm-hmm. when he lacks that Jethro, when all he has is a protege that he's pouring into, mm-hmm. good dude, yeah, but he's pouring into that dude. Yeah. All he's got is a brother that sometimes he can count on and sometimes he can't count on. Mm-hmm. I mean, he goes off on an extended prayer and fast retreat, comes back down. The brother has fashioned a calf mm-hmm. that the people are worshiping. Yeah. Isn't it really interesting that later on in Moses' life, when that drain of leadership is so relentless that when the people come requesting water and he goes to God mm-hmm. and says, God, what, what should I do? God gives him direction in anger and frustration. He disobeys God. He strikes the rock instead of speaking, speaking to it. And God says, hey, because of that, because you failed to mm. honor me as holy in the sight of the people, you won't make it to the promised land. At ISO, we always strive to provide discounts and incentives for our students. Now, we're thrilled to announce our best value ever, the ISO All Access Pass. For just $99 per month, any student can access our entire learning platform an ever-expanding library of fascinating, groundbreaking teaching at your fingertips for the average price of just one ISO course. There has never been such a prime opportunity to pursue your biblical education. Students in many traditional schools pay $100 to learn every day for every single course. With the All Access Pass, that amount gives you access to our entire course catalog. At ISO, you can learn from world-class teachers on a wide variety of subjects, all at your own pace. With the subscription-based model of the All Access Pass, there are no obligations to put yourself in debt for decades. If you're hungry to learn about the Word, there's never been a better value. That's countless hours of teaching and materials with no limit on how much you can learn. Now, more than ever, ISO is excited to connect the Word with the world. Go to isow.org to get started with the All Access Pass today. I wonder, I wonder if there was this relational gap in Moses. Because you think of other aspects in Moses' life. I mean, they come to a mountain. They see this mysterious majesty on the mountain. They mm-hmm. hear this glorious sound. And what do the people say? You're different, Moses. Yeah. You talk to God. We don't need to talk to him because if we talk to him directly, if we'll he die. talks to us directly, we're yeah. dead. And they say we prefer it that way because yeah. we're so scared. You carry the yeah. weight, Moses. You do the deal, Moses. Mm-hmm. And could it be, I know we're just surmising, mm-hmm. could it be that the weight of carrying that leadership for all those years and the lack of that close confidant mm-hmm. who is shoulder to shoulder with him like Jethro was, could it be that that caused that gap in Moses emotionally mm-hmm. to disobey God, to dishonor God as holy among the people and cause him to miss out on the promised land? Mm-hmm. So I'm saying that to say this. 
to keep those relationships requires a level of intentionality that yeah. most of us we don't see. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I was part of the COG, Church of God, for years and years and years, all of my adult life to 40. And uh, felt a leading to start a non denominational church and started that church and led that church for 15 years. And during, during those years, do you know what happened? What? I drifted from 40 years of relationships because life. Leading yeah. that church just required... It just happened. It required yeah. everything of me there was. Mm-hmm. So I failed to keep connecting. I connected with a few, but not many. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when when my wife and I had that crash, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I moved back to Tennessee and uh, started going to my brother's church. He pastors the Church of God in Watts Bar. And it was, was interesting to me that the people that reconnected with me and helped love me and my wife through our crash were those old relationships that I had failed to intentionally cultivate for almost 15 years. Wow. And boy, I made a commitment. I I won't, I won't let the busyness of ministry Mm -hmm. and probably part of that disconnection occurred even before the 15 years, Mm -hmm. but I will not allow the busyness of ministry to keep me from intentionally connecting with people who can breathe life and perspective Mm -hmm. and awareness and knowledge into me that it's essential for me making it to the other side. What's amazing to me is reading the Bible. There's such a clear push in the New Testament, that they prioritized relationship yeah. in the body of Christ. Like to levels we ha- we have a hard time understanding. I, I have a hard time understanding. Yeah. Because for one thing, I mean, you want to talk about people that are carrying a lot of weights. The yeah. people in the early church would be some of those. Paul, who's traveling constantly, gets to take a break here and there. But at the end of a lot of these letters, he just has this long list of all these people who yes. he knows, and he has names committed to memory. Yes. And he has relationships relationships with every single one of them. Yes. I think about what Jesus said before he was uh, crucified. And he said in his ministry, for one thing, he said that we would be known by the world as his disciples because of our love for one another. For, yeah. And then he prayed in John uh, that God would make the body of Christ one as yes. he and the Father yes. are one. Yes. So those are the kinds of relationships. That's just beyond accountability. Yeah. I think those relationships keep you <laughs> in the rock. They Absolutely. help you keep you in Christ, keep you in your relationships. Yeah, I did a series of messages, and I've, I've got plans for it to become a book called Got Your Six. Mm. And, it, and it's about all of those relationships in Scripture. If, if you look at Scripture, if one word could be used, if you were limited to one word to describe Scripture, to describe God's heart, it would be relationships. Mm-hmm. He pursues a relationship with us. He redeemed us to pursue a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And that work of redemption extends to the way we relate to other people. And man, you nailed it too in terms of Paul. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a dude who was tough as nails. Mm -hmm. You can't get tougher than him. That's right. And yet again and again, Paul was a byproduct of somebody who invested intentionally in him, Barnabas. Mm -hmm. When nobody believed in him, When the leaders in the Jerusalem church were scared of him, Mm -hmm. Barnabas was the guy who said, hey, Paul, come with me. i got to introduce you to these guys so they know you're for real, you're authentic. Mm -hmm. He introduces them. He creates that pathway. And even though they would later have a falling out, Uh isn't that interesting? It is. Barnabas and Paul had a discussion that ended in their separation in terms of direction Mm -hmm. and ministry. But Paul keeps investing himself in people. You nail this, Romans 16 is basically a list of significant players in his life and ministry that he doesn't want the church to forget. Man, that's awesome. And he's, and he called, so if I were to say, (laughs) yeah, if I were to say, because this all started with what do leaders need, Mm -hmm. you know, to keep leading, keep your personal time with God, Mm -hmm. order your private world, Mm -hmm. make sure you invest intentionally. In your relational world, those are two yeah. absolute essentials for leaders. And, mm-hmm. and if I could offer a third. Yeah, sure. 
always be attentive to your emotional health. Mm -hmm. That's something I was not. Emotional and mental health, th those are really, really intertwined. Mm -hmm. Peter Scazzaro has written, in my, in my estimation, a book that is a must read for anybody who does ministry in 2023 and following. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Highly recommend that book. If I were pastoring today, it would be a must read of our team every year. Wow. Because here's what I noticed when I read that book, I noticed how emotionally unhealthy I had become. Can I ask you just a question about that? Not to cut you yeah, off, yeah. but you mentioned to me, and uh, I think we were talking before the first interview, um, you mentioned to me when you were so busy that you almost just became numb to the indicators, what would have been indicators, hey, I am, I'm in a place where I need some help emotionally. Yeah. Um, and I, I've experienced that before actually as well, uh, probably not the degree that you were in, uh, to where you, you just were feeling overwhelmed, didn't even realize it. But I've heard about people in, that are carrying such weights in leadership at times in history, where it was desperate especially, that they just shut that part of themselves off. They, yeah. they couldn't look inward. What is a way to get back to checking up on yourself? Are there ways that you can do that self-assessment when you're just so busy? Yeah. I, I know I sound like a broken record, Matthew, and I mm -hmm. apologize. No, it's fine. That involves that outside help we referred to mm -hmm. in the previous podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a firm believer that probably everyone in ministry needs some kind of counseling on a regular basis. And, and I can't, I can't overstress this. It needs to be with someone who's gifted mm -hmm. and thoroughly committed to God's word. Wow. There are some dangerous counselors out there. There, there, there if, if people, uh, anything that involves human beings mm -hmm. is, is prone to have someone dangerous involved mm -hmm. in it. That can yeah. be ministry. It can yeah. be counseling. So there are some dangerous counseling counselors who can give dangerous counsel. But there are also some great ones. And people like... The guy I keep going back to, Dr. Michael, mm -hmm. Relationships, Inc. in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And by the way, he does Zoom counseling. That's so awesome. anybody anywhere could link up with Dr. Michael. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy is so thoroughly centered on Christ, so thoroughly knowledgeable of God's word mm -hmm. that I knew I could open up to him and he would not steer me in direction that was contrary to mm -hmm. God's word. So I would say to you, I didn't recognize my lack of self-awareness. It baffles me to this day. Yeah. I mean, it really baffles me. Working with Dr. Michael, it, it, it put a spotlight on areas of health that needed to be addressed. So I can't overestimate that. And being a part of some kind of small group. Mm -hmm. Three brothers, by the way, I have three brothers. Mm -hmm. Two of them are dedicated Christians. Those brothers stood with me. They're, they're not the ones I'm mentioning right now, though I should, because mm -hmm. they were there reminding me of God's word, standing in faith with me. They're still there. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when I talk about people who love you and are not impressed by you, <laughs> your brothers yeah, yeah, fit that's, that that's category. True. I've and got two brothers. Those yeah. guys, when I say <laughs> kick me in the seat of the pants metaphorically, those brothers would do it actually. Yeah. They, they would actually. They, they would actually. Mine whoop too. Me. That's yeah. right. <laughs> but so I, I've needed them, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention they're deep. They're not just my brothers. They're my deep close yeah. friends. Uh, but then there was a brotherhood of my small group mm. that just was relentless with me. They will help you see those things. I would also say I was with a pastor recently, and. My work with John Maxwell, sometimes I get to work with pastors, with mm -hmm. groups of pastors, and I was working with a group of pastors on this occasion. And we spent an, an entire day talking about uh, pastoring for the long haul. Have you reached your quitting point mm -hmm. was the name of, of the day of leadership training we, we led that day. And what I saw among that group of pastors was this. They were part of the same district mm -hmm. in terms of their church. So there mm -hmm. were like 12 present mm -hmm. of maybe 18 or 20 churches. Those pastors had a deep relational bond with one another. They knew that they could call on one another. That's incredible. And because they were all in the fray, they wow. were all in the fight, 
They didn't have to impress one another. And thankfully, they had gotten beyond that, hey, bro, how many did you have this Sunday? Yeah. It wasn't that kind of talk. It was talk about, how can I pray with you? Mm-hmm. How can I lift you up? And they were sharing their soul. They were sharing their heart. Mm. And if you can be a part of that kind of group of ministers, oh, Man. that that day with them was so mm. life-giving to me. Wow, that's incredible. I think that it's such an important thing. I just want to end real quick. So you talked about the importance of having someone on the outside come in to help you, the importance of having a person that can help you when you're carrying the weights of leadership to check in on you with your integrity. I just want to talk about the most important thing of all that you mentioned at the beginning, which is the relationship with God. So I grew up in a classical Pentecostal, charismatic slash classical Pentecostal background. I've been in many different churches in that regard. But one thing that my family, my father, was very diligent to pray, always. I mean, extremely diligent to pray and read the Bible. Um, One thing in my own prayer life that I saw happening and I, to, to this day, you know, I think everybody's always learning when it comes to their prayer life, always trying to find what God is asking of them in that season. And I've heard people say, many ministers say, that there is an importance in not just speaking, but listening. Mm. And I'm sure that you, from what you just said, you'd know what that means. And I feel like that that's important. That's something I, everybody's probably still trying to learn that. I'm still learning that to listen and to know the voice of God and to remind myself consistently in prayer to be listening. What is it like in prayer in that aspect of your relationship with God, to hear the voice of God, to quiet yourself? Yeah, yeah. I I think it's, I think it's critical. Mm -hmm. Um, My life has been deeply formed by by mentors, either those I've known Mm -hmm. or those who have become my mentors through the books I've read. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I read a book. I've read a lot of books on prayer through the years, but I read a book that it was life-changing to me. And it's a book by John Eldridge called Mountain Moving Prayer. Mm. It's, it's beautiful. And, and here's why it's beautiful. Eldridge believes in the fullness of the Spirit. But Eldridge also has a, has a heart towards some of the classical forms of Christianity, mm-hmm. some of uh, the liturgies yeah. that have deeply formed Christianity. So in Mount Moving Prayer, he taught me a form of prayer that I wasn't very familiar with that involved talking to God, mm-hmm. but listening to God. So one of the questions that I, I regularly ask is this question, Holy Spirit, What are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And out of that, I remember this passage, Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue. He wakens me morning by morning. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen as one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. Mm -hmm. I've not turned away. And there's hardly a day that goes by that I don't quote that in my prayer time to God, praying, God, open my ear. In one passage, he refers to the ear singular, which is interesting Mm -hmm. to me. I'm not certain I've arrived at what that means. And then in the next verse, he says he's opened my ears, plural, both, why does he differentiate? I mm. think it, I think it must involve an intensity, yeah. an intensity of listening. Yeah. In other words, I mean, have Whisper. you ever had someone t- and you turn your ear? He opened my ear. In other words, Holy Spirit, whisper. Wow. I'm really being quiet, so I, I really want. Mm-hmm. He's opened my ear that I might hear. He's opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. I've not turned away. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yes, the listening thing is critical. I think, I think that's also the most difficult. Yeah. Because it requires us to slow down. Mm. And isn't that beautiful? Um, this episode in the life of Elijah, we just heard a message on this at OCI last Tuesday mm-hmm. night. Uh, 
Justin, I can't remember, Justin, was it Graham did mm -hmm. a great job Justin teaching Graham. this? Wow, what, what a terrific message. Mm -hmm. But I've hung out in 1 mm -hmm. Kings 19 so often, especially, mm -hmm. especially since my crash. God puts on this multimedia show for Elijah. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is not in the wind, not yeah. in the earthquake, not, not in the fire. Then a still small voice. And Elijah wraps his cloak around himself. Why? He knows he's in the presence of God. And he knows with God here like this, I need every part of me clothed. I need every part of me hidden because God is present. What did God say in that moment? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know exactly. We know on the outskirt of that, God gives him an assignment mm -hmm. about a prophet he's got to mentor, mm -hmm. about kings he's got to anoint, assignments he's got to complete. But what did, what did God say in the whisper? Mm. We don't know. Why? Yeah. Because the things that God wants to reveal to us during those moments, they are too precious wow. to be recorded or revealed to anybody. That was God's message to one man who needed him in that one moment. And it mm. was so personal that God didn't allow it to be written down. He just wanted us to know, when my prophet needed me, and needed a message, I spoke. But what enabled him to listen it was a 125-mile yeah. journey to one location, mm. a 250-mile journey to yeah. another location yeah. to finally get him into this place where he's rid himself of all distraction. God even puts on the multimedia to say, don't be mm -hmm. looking at that. And then the whisper, wow. and God's got his attention. So, man, the listening part, critical. What blows my mind about that account that's wild to me is that the angel of the Lord comes to him, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Then the word of the Lord comes to him. <laughs> and then the Lord himself comes to him. Yes. And each time he repeats the same thing. Yes. It's his complaint. <laughs> He's like, first the angel of the Lord comes, feeds him. Yes. <laughs> and he says, uh, he says, all this just happened to me. I can't believe it. I'm, yes. I'm ready to give up. I want to die. I'm ready yeah. to throw in the towel. And the angel of the Lord says, keep going. You're going to see the Lord. Yes. And then the word of the Lord comes to yes. him like its own. It is, a, it is the Lord himself. Yes. But it's another layer. And yeah. he does the same thing. He says, yeah. I'm just ready to give up. I'm ready to throw in the towel. And it says, hold on, Elijah. Yes. The Lord is about to come. <laughs> and then the Lord reveals himself stronger than he ever did before. But yes. Elijah just said the same thing. Yes. He kept on getting it out of his system and getting it out. What, which says something to us, Matthew, Yeah, that God can handle our complaints. Ah, that's amazing. And if we need to go through all of that, mm. if we need to vent vertically mm -hmm. to get it all out to God, God can handle it yeah. because he wants to get us to that place of authenticity where mm -hmm. we can truly hear from him. Wow. Because you're right. He just... He repeats the same thing. And it's like at some point, God was like, time out. We, we, we've heard this broken record we before. Got <laughs> Don't do it again. Yeah. He doesn't, though. Uh -huh. He's so yeah. patient and loving and allows him to process because in the processing, he gets to a place of clarity where he can really hear God. And that's amazing because Jesus, did he not say ask yeah. and keep on asking? Come on. And it's because Jesus also says, now, if you went to a cruel judge, mm -hmm. If you see a, a, a widowed woman and she has to wear that judge down, yeah. if she's willing to do that with a judge that doesn't fear God or man, how yeah. much more will your father in heaven? That sounds so confusing because yeah. you think to yourself, well, Jesus, why do, if God's so loving, if the father <laughs> loves us, why do I got to wear him down? Right. But his point was there's something different about the father. If you would do that for a judge that doesn't want to listen to you. Amen. How much more should you do it for the one who does want to hear what you have to say? Amen. And I love what you just said, that the secret is we have to do it to get clarity so yeah. that we can finally hear what he wants to tell us. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Amen. Wow. <laughs> well, Pastor Chris, this has been amazing. I love this episode. I love hanging out with you, Matthew. <laughs> Thank I you mean so it. much. I love it. Yeah. I, I just wanted to leave you guys with what he had to say that I thought was powerful. Those of you that are just listening right now, if you are wanting to draw near to the Lord, if you're carrying many weights and you need his help, just say to him, by yourself in a quiet room, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Yeah. Thank you so much. And you guys have a great time. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. Thank you, Matthew. And we'll catch you again later. God bless.